ideas on about democracy, usually known as digital democracy, or how to mobilize using uh, new technologies and, and discover um, possibilities, but also limitations about digital democracy. I think we heard a lot this morning already about lack of involvement, uh, lack of, if you will, mobilization in many countries uh, in Europe, East and West, and this may well be a solution. Whether it's a panacea um, remains to be seen. Um, and um, to guide us through to uh, um, and moderate uh, this panel um, is uh, Mathieu Lefebvre, who will moderate our discussion. And as I said, we have workout groups, and then we'll come back here um, later on. Um, and Mathieu has also kindly agreed to moderate um, the, the, the feedback or what people bring back from the, from the working groups. Um, we're very grateful for Mathieu to do this. He's very experienced. He currently is the executive director of the New Cities Foundation, um, a nonprofit organization that incubates, promotes, and scales urban innovation. He very much uses these kinds of technology, but previously he also worked for the World Bank and in the UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations, serving in Afghanistan as well as the Middle East. And Mathieu has been both a, a close observer and more importantly, a strong supporter of the School of Public Policy ever since we started off. He moderated one of our leadership labs, given all the tremendous experience that he has had in large organizations, but also in movements and currently in the New Cities Foundation. So Mathieu, I'll hand over the floor to you and thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, Wolfgang, for, for having me and, and, uh, and for the discussion this morning that I thought was, um, was extremely interesting. And it's so very interesting from an outsider's point. I, I'm French. I'm Franco-American, but I'm French. And in France, we've just gone through a slightly traumatic uh, few weeks with uh, municipal elections in France and a similar landslide to the right, including the National Front. So it was very interesting for, for, for me to listen to the Hungarian experience. And if anything, uh, it's nice to see that uh, our fellow Europeans are dealing with the same problems, if not yet the same solutions, um, all over Europe. Um, and uh, the, I thought the second panel was also very interesting in, in, in the response. And so what we're going to try to do is to explore um, s sort of an, an emerging uh, field, um, which is uh, referred to here as, as digital democracy. Um, uh, which is basically looking at um, how the advent of the ubiquitous, in, ubiquitous internet um, and the fact that in this room there's probably 150 devices that are connected to the world and how potentially that can, that, that can play um, as, as to, to help roll back the rollback. Um, let me start by, by, well, first of all, we have a, a really great panel of, of, um, uh, of people who have a very rich uh, experience, and so we're gonna uh, we're gonna focus a little bit of our time in the first part of the panel from hearing from them. So they will not make very boring opening statements, but I think they will make very interesting. Uh, they will tell you interesting stories about some of the the, the work that they have all all three of them have been doing in this field. Um, and so uh, I, I won't introduce the panel uh, in in great depth because you've got their bios in in your. In your, in your books, but I really think that we've brought together three people from uh, all over Europe, uh, from Berlin, Amsterdam, and London, um, uh, to, tell, to, to talk about some of these examples. Let me first start by saying that um, even though we're going to talk about the future and technology and so on, I, I think it's worth looking, starting this off by looking at, into the past a little bit. I think democracy... Um, it has always been in crisis. If anything, democracy for the last 200 years, but certainly if you look at the 20th century, has had seven, eight major episodes of crisis. So I think I would start by saying that it's probably not a good idea to think that this crisis is the biggest or unique. I mean, certainly after the First World War, democracy was in crisis after the Second World War. The financial crisis is just the latest in a series of crises. I mean, if you look, if you read, uh, you know, Tocqueville and others, I think their hope in democracy was based not in the fact that it was going to avoid crises altogether, but it, that it, it's a pretty good system at, at bouncing back 
from crises. And so where I am hopeful and enthusiastic is that um, we will get out of this um, as democracy has always gotten out of it. It's complicated, it's, it's, it, it's hard to do, but it's, it, it does happen over history. And so perhaps coming to the, the topic um, we're going to explore here is one of the questions that we should look at, all, all, all three of you should, should perhaps examine, is how digital democracy um, and these alternative approaches uh, do offer opportunities for this particular bounce back. Is the advent of, uh, we're going to talk about online participation, we're going to talk about political narratives, we're going to talk about the Citizen 2.0, is this whole group of topics we're going to explore going to be part of the how we bounce back from this particular crisis. And so I think that's, um, that, that will be um, uh, interesting um, to look at. Of course, given the fact that we're supposed to be the participatory panel and the, the, you know, we will make this highly interactive. So please start thinking about your questions, interrupt me and interrupt our speakers if you feel very strongly about anything. Use Twitter, I will take out my iPad, not to check my email, but to look what, you're, what people are saying on Twitter. Um, the hashtag is no longer here, but it's hashtag SPP rollback. So do tweet, of course. How could I say otherwise? Um, and we will start uh, using technology, the technology that we used uh, this morning, just for some, with some very light uh, voting questions. So those of you who do not have a voting machine, uh, you might want to get one because there will be a couple of... Um, We'll do four. We'll do two now and two a bit later on in the discussion. Um, so turn them on. And please don't start the clock, because I saw a lot of people being very nervous about not getting their vote in time. We don't want to be accused of being anti-democratic. So, um, Okay, so the first question is, how many times have you taken political action in the last six months? Political action can be a petition, a demonstration, a political meeting, whatever you think is a p political action. And you've got five answers. Once, between two and five times, more than five times, more than ten times for the super political active, and then zero. So you can vote now. Oh, now they've given you 15 seconds. We're making progress. Okay. So let's see how politically active you guys are. I can't see, you can't see the result here. Okay. So the majority of you have taken some kind of political action between two and ten times, I guess. Um, okay, good. So we have a politically mobilized group. Um, okay, let's go to question number two and to look at what your political actions have been. Have they been more in person? So if you moving somewhere to say something online or both or some other form of, of, of political action. So now you can vote on the type of political action you've taken. And let's say the, the, the majority of your polit political actions have been one of these. Okay. Both. Interesting. So, yeah, that's interesting. So mostly both and with a strong online component. Okay, great. Interesting. Okay, so what we will structure the panel. We, we will finish at um, 3.15. So we've got an hour and 15 minutes. Um, so the way we will structure the panel is I'm going to give each uh, of our panelists uh, a, uh, a few minutes to basically give us their view on, uh, a general view on, on this digital democracy with some examples about your, your own experience. Um, and, uh, and, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll go to some questions from you, from, from me, and, and we'll have a discussion. So the first sort of 25 minutes will be devoted to, to our, our, our three speakers, and then we'll open up um, immediately. Um, so I want to start with, uh, we will start with Julia. Um, so I'll, I'll give you the floor, and if you, can, if you want to briefly introduce yourself, I don't want to do long introductions because you've got all the details in here. Um, hello. Thanks for listening or being willing to listen to us. Um, I'm Julia. I'm a 
live in Berlin and I'm a political scientist mostly and I used to do some politics. Um, so I want to start with more of the well, the theoretical ideas that I had with the internet and then I, that, I, that me, made me um, trying to work with the internet in terms of democracy. So um, I think I was, I'm probably one of the, um, probably the youngest digital native here because the first time I was in the internet I was like seven or eight in 1993. Um, I was really privileged. And um, I just used it as an um, information channel um, to ask questions, although it was not really easy, because first it was in English and I was eight, <laughs> and second, the internet was not that full of information back then. But I realized really quickly that it's um, a huge opportunity to connect people and to give people the chance to um, speak their mind and to kind of trying to find a, a consent or having a rational discourse. So um, I started, I founded a state. Uh, I tried to um, think about how democracy can work with the internet because there are some problems. For example, there is no, um, no election, uh, there, there is no election possible because it's not possible to do it, what's the word? Um, yeah, e-voting, it's uh, not, I forgot the word, I'm sorry. So you, you can't do it without people, you know, um, you can, sorry, you can't have an election online uh, with your hidden name, like, anonymous. anonymous. <laughs> okay, that's uh, kind of embarrassing, <laughs> like one of the, well, yeah, it is. Uh, so it's not a, it's not possible to do it anonymously. So this is, for example, a problem when you consider the German constitution where it says explicitly that it has to be anonymous. So I thought with friends and with other people around, how can we deal with that? How we, can we assure that it's still a democratic election, that it's still kind of anonymous, kind of free, kind of, you know, equal? Uh, but we we get some ideas about like self-control within some so within defined groups and so on. Um, and then I started um, with the Pirate Party. I don't know if anyone knows about the party. Some people are nodding, okay. So I know the word not, but not anonymous, it's fine. Um, so we, I found this group and they, I, I realized a lot of people had the same ideas, the same, um, wishes the same um, visions about the, using the internet to um, make elections more dynamic, more easy, more flexible. And um, the party adapted the idea of liquid democracy. Has anybody heard of that before? Okay, yeah, my panelist is nodding. That's good. So it's basically a system where people can put um, texts um, and uh, builds or whatever you want to call it, and then people can vote on it. So, but as we know, it's not possible anonymously, so it's, um, you can see how the people voted on each topic. You have different topics, of course, as it is in politics, uh, environment, security issues, and so on. And the interesting thing is that first you always know who voted for what, but in terms of issues, not in terms of elections. So um, this is in a political party, for example, extremely interesting because you have a record, a voting record. Um, and then the second uh, thing about um, liquid democracy is um, delegation. So you can delegate your voice if you don't, you know, if you don't have any idea about environment, um, you can delegate to someone you, you think that actually has um, enough background and enough knowledge. So what happens is that you have a kind of flexible representative system based on the internet and based on, um, well, based on the idea that you can 
not know everything all the time, but that you can choose the person who represents you and your ideas or your issues, and you can always withdraw it. This is basically representative democracy, but in a more flexible way. Um, and first I was really I was really passionate about it. I thought it was a, it's a great idea, but of course, and it is in politics, people start fighting. So the question of anonymity and whether it's really a free voting when everybody is always able to see your record came up. Um, issues about privacy, issues about whatever people come up with, it's not, you know, you can manipulate it, and so on, and so on. So this is the reason why the Pirate Party in Germany, for example, has been fighting about this topic for um, five years now, and still not has, like, a solid system. Um, but on the other hand, it was a, there is a problem with too much, peop like, people getting power, like, super delegates, in a way. I don't think it's a problem. I think it's actually a good thing because it's transparent. You can see who delegates onto whom um, and so on. Well, and uh, we started to, or we wanted to use the system within the party, but a lot of problems came up. So the participation, for example, was the first problem. There were issues uh, voted on by 70 people. The Pirate Party had, at to some, at, at some point, 40,000 members. 70 people to 40,000 members, or 30,000 members, that's a problem. Um, then, of course, a lot of, um, there was no, um, it was not binding for the people in the parliament that the Pirate Party already has in Germany. And so on. So it's like this idea of making democracy more flexible and trying to break through this static, parliamentarian um, industry, I have to say, um, is actually quite promising, I think. But the problem is it's still that there are still people using it. So this means the bills or the taxes within the system are not always of good quality. Um, sometimes they have like they're really just poor quality because people just writing stuff that sounds good, but they don't think it through. So populists have some kind of, have it easier in the system, potentially. Um, which doesn't mean that, well, on the other hand, there are the delegates for that to kind of filter that. But if it's like not um, a paid politician that is a delegate in the system, it's in the free time, so the person who has maybe a lot of knowledge about the issue, still has the problem that um, she has to do it in her free time. And uh, same problem again, quality issues. Um, and then of course, a lot of people think it's not um, accessible enough um, because you need a computer um, and you can't use it on your smartphone, for example, because there is no app for it and so on. It's like a really developing program. Like, a progress or a developing a process that you can't really that a lot like a lot of people are standing in the way of it so this is I think um, from my experience a huge problem the Pirate Party Germany had the idea of liquid democracy in 2010 the system is called liquid feedback and it's still not running it's still not working um, there has been some um, program developed within the system, but it's not really working. Um, so it's a, to some degree, it's a disappointment that people actually don't really want to be in the process of democratic decisions um, to a high degree. Um, that means that you still have like a small percentage of people that are actually using the system, actually working um, and we have the same problem as before, um, like the dictatorship of the activists, um, in a way. So, because in the Pirate Party Germany, there is this saying, who, the one who's doing is right. So if you do stuff, you're always right. Um, which is, of course, 
a problem, especially when we talk about right-wing uh, movements, when we talk about um, fascist movements. Um, so there is a variety of problems that comes up that liquid democracy and the idea of digital democracy is promising, but right now, for me, I don't see that it actually will change something for the really better because it's not, I don't think it's not about the way we execute democracy and it's not about the way we come to decisions, it's about the decisions. So yeah, that's basically it. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Thanks, Julia, that was very, very interesting. Um, I'm going to ask you if there's any clarification questions or points specifically about the example of the Pirate Party, because then when we get into a more general discussion, I want to make sure that you all have a good understanding of these case studies that essentially we're looking at. So any clarification questions about Julia's experience? And uh, before I hand over to, to Tim, and I think, uh, Julia, thanks a lot, because I think you've touched upon a lot of really interesting uh, topics that are true for all online movements. You talk about, um, you know, the dictatorship of the activists. You talk about the poor quality of the texts and stuff, which I think is, is very interesting. Before I turn to you, Tim, I, I want to thank uh, I thank the School of Public Public Policy for mo removing the desk that we we asked to remove because we thought it was a little bit. So now we have a really flexible and participatory setup in our furniture, which is great. Um, so let me turn to you, Tim, uh, and I think, uh, I think it's a great uh, transition to you uh, specifically about the, the point of the professionalization of all this, because you represent an organization that is definitely at the cusp of the professionalization of these, uh, these movements. So, Tim. Thanks. I, I feel like I'm the, the least legitimate person in this room to talk about democracy in Europe. Since um, I'm an Australian who grew up in Australia, spent since 2010, I've been working in New York. I've only recently moved to, to London, um, so I'm, uh, I'm, I'm kind of an outsider coming in. Um, but maybe there's a perspective or two that that, that, that brings. Um, the, the reason why, I mean, I share uh, a lot of the concerns that have been expressed today. I think the institutional state of democracy and democratic and, and political parties uh, in Europe is weak. Um, at the same time, the reason why I have some optimism is that there's a whole lot of opportunities that exist now and a whole lot of strategies and tactics that are available that really simply haven't been tried in Europe. Um, there's been such resistance to innovation within the institutional structures of politics here. Um, there's, uh, there's a lot that can be done. And you know they say the cliché that the, the darkest hour is uh, just before dawn. Um, you know, often it is the, the breakdown, the failure of the sort of traditional institutions that then creates, that sort of breaks up the soil and creates the opportunity for innovation. I, I think back to a decade ago in the US, um, during the, the first term of President Bush, um, the Iraq war, the era of Rumsfeld, torture, all of those, that, that whole period, a very, very dark period for progressives. Um, but it was the period where people woke up to the fact that the infrastructure of organising people on the progressive side of politics was really weak. Um, and that was the time when the big work was done to create um, the think tanks like the Centre for American Progress, um, pieces of democratic infrastructure like the big scale online social movements, um, the really smart focus on communication strategies so that the think tank world got out of academia and got into the sort of popular and public debates. And it's this interesting thing where innovation in political messaging in Europe seems largely to be on the right and the popular mobilisations on the right. I think in the US it's actually the opposite. And certainly in terms of the use of digital tools, the Tea Party is certainly mobilises people at one level, but a lot of that's pretty grass tops. It's pretty much, you know, a corporate money making it look as if it's a popular movement. Um, so there's an interesting kind of difference. And it was partly because they got into a crisis in that era, sort of 2003, 2004, stood back and said, what's the big picture? What's the institutional infrastructure we need to build? And, and, and started doing it and, and got money into it as well. Um, so I think something of the same exercise is needed in, in, in Europe um, and many European countries. Um, and a healthy ecosystem for democracy and, and for public engagement 
um, includes you know, political parties that are open, um, that are not closed clubs of the elites who've all gone to the same schools and you know, have the same backgrounds, but are open to sort of real people and diversity. Um, it comes down to healthy institutions that are accountable and transparent. Um, and it comes uh, as, as well to think tanks that uh, don't just sort of stay in the ivory tower world, but also focus on that kind of public engagement end. And then the stuff that I particularly am involved in doing now, which is the online um, social movement building. And I got out of, I spent six years in conventional politics. I was a Prime Minister's speechwriter. I was very involved in the backroom politics um, in uh, where I grew up in Australia. Um, but I consciously, and I was very much on the track to getting into Parliament, and I consciously chose to get out of that track and to work in this field of building new social movements. Because I really felt often from the inside of politics that even when we wanted to do good things, in a sense, we kind of lacked a social license. We lacked legitimacy because we didn't have you know, a, a public that was engaged and asking for, for us to, to act. I think that's often a missing piece. Um, and I think the politics in, in Europe, by and large, is even more elitist and even more closed to outsiders and less engaged with the public um, than where, where I uh, grew up. So I, I wanted to share um, just five thoughts from, uh, and reflections from the social movement building work that, that I've been involved with. Purpose is a, it's a business, but it's a social business. It's, it's, it's driven not by profit, but by really social impact and works across the field from gun control movement in, in the US to poverty, to environmental issues, to LGBT rights, human rights campaigns, um, Global South as well as Global North. So it has a diversity of, of, of working. Um, so five, five reflections. Um, one is, in, in terms of developing movement thinking, thinking in terms of building movements rather than just talking about issues, engaging people, we need to, th we need to think about it the narrative. We need to have a narrative. We need to answer the question in simple terms. What's wrong with the world? Why have those things gone wrong? Uh, and what's the solution? And how can I be a part of it? And I think the right answers those questions really well. I think if I asked you what's Jobbik's message, for example, I think you could answer that question. If I asked you what the message on the side of the left is in answer to that question, I think you get a lot of confusion. And it's true, in part, that's because the world is complex. But we need to have simpler messages. We need to have narratives that answer that, those big picture questions. So that's the first thing, a big picture story. Um, secondly, we need authentic voices. You know, when we started working on uh, the minimum wage campaign for fast food workers in New York, we didn't start with the messages of union leaders. In fact, we didn't use them at all. We took a woman who uh, is a single mother, lives in a homeless shelter in New York, because even though she works full time for McDonald's, she can't afford a place to live in New York. She's authentic, she's real. In an era where people are you know, sick of the robotic machine politician, it's the authentic voices of real people that cut through. And to some extent, I mean, when you build the social movements, you know, we look for those authentic voices. So it's not that, you know, they just bubble up. You do go and look for them. But, but they are the forefront, not the charismatic leader, but the real people. And it's a real switch in tone when you, when you, you change your voice from that sort of top down to, to much more the bottom up. Thirdly, in thinking about movements, you build them around people's identity, not around the issues, not around the facts. So you think of people's experience as a member of a movement. You think of how can I, we get people saying, I am part of this. You know, I'm part of the civil rights movement, for example. Um, why did that happen in the 50s, 60s in America? Because people didn't just think of the, the issues about enfranchising African Americans from an abstract issue-based point of view, they felt they were part of something that was about changing the world. And that's a big shift. It's not about membership. It's about personal identity and being part of something larger than yourself and having a sense of your, your agency, your capacity to do something useful that can make a difference in the world. So the fourth thing is it's about action and participation, right? not just about a thing, a problem, a campaign, but you always think about how, how, what's the entry point for somebody who's never done a political act 
ever before in their lives? How do we bring them in? And that might be in the digital world, it's very much, it's the Facebook like, you know, it's retweeting something. Um, but there's a journey to take people on. You don't leave them in that world, you encourage them to step into offline action so that they join something in their community, they initiate something, they have a house party. So when recently we were building a movement around um, the what we call the peer economy, the sort of sharing economy, that new model of the, the Ubers and Airbnb and uh, Kickstarter and so on, which is a really exciting new opportunity for people to sort of take control of their, their lives and new jobs and making money and so on. We started that movement called Peers, which is now a quarter of a million people in just four months. Um, we started with them saying, have dinner with Peers. Meet other people in your neighbourhood who, are, like you, are trying to build something for themselves uh, using the opportunity of digital platforms. So it's all about that. It's all about thinking about participation and, and action and stepping people through increasing levels of, um, of involvement. Finally, the fifth thing, um, it's about diversity in the tactics that you use. Don't just do the same old thing. And in the online world, that's also don't just do the same old petition that people have been doing for the last 10 years, right? Just as, you know, don't do what in the 1960s was really radical, a street march. But, I mean, grandpa's doing the street march, right, still. I mean, it's not particularly interesting unless there's an awful lot of people. It doesn't grab media attention. Do something that's a bit more savvy, that has a bit of rebel energy in it. So, for example, the movement that we got going in Rio, which is a sort of a citizen participation, anti-corruption movement in, um, based around millennials in Rio. So they're campaigning on a sanitation campaign, which sounds pretty boring, and how do you get people excited about toilets? But what they did recently to sort of engage interest and get people involved was take a bunch of toilets onto the beach at Copacabana, and they just had a lot of young people, good-looking young Brazilians, um, sitting on the toilets on the beach, tweeted these, message, these uh, pictures, got into media all around the, the country and, in fact, internationally, and put a spotlight on the fact that half the city doesn't have access to sanitation, yet it, all households pay a tax and the money's going into the coffers of political parties to run campaigns. It's a corruption issue, but they made it interesting. And there's lots of ways in which you can turn you know, old issues into something more interesting, using some of those sort of digital tactics and not doing the same thing all the time, right? Like, so changing it, switching it around and making it a bit of fun. Um, so that's five ideas. If we have a moment a bit later on, I might um, uh, show a, um, a video that just kind of captures a, a, a couple of examples of, of those. Great. Do you want to do the video now, maybe? Sure. Then, we'll, then that way we don't break up from discussion later. Is the video queued up? How long is this video? It is two minutes. Two minutes. But I, 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 this, can be minutes. A, this can be a moment of audience participation. So, because I know at this time of the afternoon, it's like candy, you know, the, the two-minute video. So the choices are... I, I've got one which is an example of how uh, a, a, a video that helped to shift the debate around marriage equality in Australia um, out of a sort of minority rights frame for the gay community towards um, a bigger story of, of, of love. Um, two minute piece. Or the other one is one that uh, we did in, in the US around money in politics and it was to take the position of the congressman um, who and make him into like a, a guy in, in the Pac-Man, if you remember the, the computer game Pac-Man, going gobble, gobble, gobble money, um, and capturing the, the way in which money is corrupted politics. So can I get a show of hands for so the marriage the equality? Marriage equality. Or the uh, uh, money in politics. Yeah, we want uh, high voter turnout in this room. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> so who won? Money in oh. politics? Always you can't have both, I'm sorry, so yeah. the You just lost your connection, your it fell down. Your cable. Your cable. Uh, okay. There you go. Two hundred and thirty-six years ago, the Founding Fathers invented America. Before that, the closest thing we had to America was France. And that wasn't very American at all. We 
la la. We all know the Constitution those guys drafted wasn't perfect. They left out all kinds of important stuff. Yet, over time, we've come together to improve our Constitution. And today, 220 million Americans have the right to vote. But, after decades of political corruption, our votes don't count quite like they used to. Right before our eyes, they're being outmuscled by another form of political power. Money. These days, if you want something in Washington, there's a surefire way to get it. Throw a congressperson a fundraiser. Yeah, 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 yeah. Political campaigns are expensive, really expensive. Martyrs, Politicians are desperate to get their hands on the money they need to pay for their next campaigns and stay in office. They know that 94% of the time, the candidate who raises the most money wins. So they spend up to 70% of their days chasing cash instead of running the country. Like junkies who will do anything to find a fix. And only a handful of billionaires and big special interests put up the big bucks. Over 80% of presidential super PAC money has come from just 196 people. The way our system works, special interests get what they pay for. That's why pizza is now considered a vegetable in school cafeterias. Why three of the country's top 10 grossing companies paid zero federal taxes in 2009. And why certain industries have enjoyed a 77,000% return on one particular kind of investment. Their lobbying dollars. It's been this way for a while, but two years ago, it got worse. The Supreme Court decided a case called Citizens United making unlimited anonymous campaign donations the law of the land and taking our democracy from flawed but fixable to sh screaming self-parody. Before Citizens United, we could at least identify the people who were pumping cash into our politics. Today, we don't even know where half of it comes from. It could literally be anyone. Excellent. Add it all up and what have you got? Our politicians represent the money that bankrolls them, not the people who vote them into office. Meaning us. They don't represent us. It makes you wonder. If those guys who invented America were around right now, what would they do? They wouldn't sit on the sidelines and watch. They'd raise hell. So that's what we're doing. When the rich try to buy our lawmakers, when politicians sell out to lobbyists, we're going to make some noise. And we'll continue to make noise until politicians blocking reform are booted from office and unlimited and anonymous campaign donations are a thing of the past. We may not have billions of dollars, but we do have millions of people. And when we come together, we can ensure that our votes count exactly as much as they're supposed to. The Constitution's pretty clear about this. It's we the people, not it the money. If you want your democracy back, join us. And if you don't, don't worry, we'll get it back for you. Great. Thanks a lot, Tim. That was very, very useful, as, as was Julia's, uh, in, in sort of setting out some of these big issues that hopefully we'll get into, uh, into the discussion. Uh, later on. Very, very interesting examples indeed, and there are many more that Purpose is working on. Um, Balaj, can I ask uh, you to tell us a little bit about what you think about this issue generally, and uh, maybe dive into your own personal experience, which I think it was here in, sorry, I'm not using a microphone, which doesn't matter to you, but it matters to the millions of people who are watching us on the internet. I will say that again for you masses online. Um, Thank you very much, Tim, for that. Um, and I'm going to hand, hand over the, um, the mic to Balaj to tell us a little bit about how he thinks about these issues on digital democracy and his own story, um, which is partly uh, takes place here in Budapest around a really interesting uh, movement that I, I, I'd read about and was very interested to, uh, to, to know more about uh, talking to you called Mila. Over to you. Uh, thank you. So my name is Bodo Balaj, and I've, what I'd like to uh, talk about uh, uh, very briefly today is uh, my personal story of uh, starting Mila and then emigrating from this country uh, in the course of three years. Uh, and uh, while doing that, I would like to address uh, the role of technology in, um, in uh, rolling back the rollback. Uh, so what we do, uh, what we did uh, in uh, early in late 2010, early uh, 2011, uh, was to 
organize uh, people opposing uh, the Orban government in Hungary. Uh, and the apropos uh, we used was the first big interventions of that government uh, on media law. Uh, and uh, that gave the name uh, to us, One Million for the Freedom of Press in Hungary, or MILA, uh, which has turned out to be quite a success in a number of measures. Uh, it has become a Facebook group uh, that has gathered around or more than 100,000 uh, members in a quite a short time. And uh, in, uh, till late 2012, it was able to call hundreds of thousands of people to mass protests on the streets of Budapest. Uh, or place of choice was the uh, free press road uh, at the uh, Pest side of the Erzsébet Bridge. Uh, and I would like to uh, tell how that uh, thing grew and uh, well the end uh, it's not that important but uh, but uh, my, how I ended it might might be so what has happened really is that uh, a number of people uh, quite ordinary citizens started up a number of Facebook groups uh, with all kinds of missions all kinds of funny names they were just seeding uh, various Facebook uh, Facebook groups, and uh, one of one of them suddenly grew up. And the fact that the the group named One Million for the Freedom of Press blew up in terms of uh, likes or members was just a pure chance or coincidence. Uh, but it acted as a lightning rod. It was able to channel all the growing dissatisfaction and resentment and dissent towards the first acts of the government. Uh, and it stopped in terms of growing. It grew around to that 100,000, now it's in 130,000, but it never grew big. It never grew uh, more than that. And uh, I'm really curious, I was really curious why we are not able to grow, grow beyond that 100,000. Uh, and I have a number of, uh, a number of answers. And uh, one of those answers uh, uh, just contributed to my decision to leave this country. Uh, and that is uh, uh, very much connected to the topic of the uh, discussion uh, this morning, as why what happened uh, yesterday in the country is that the limits uh, there are very strong limits, this is my, my take on the issue, there are very strong limits uh, to civil society in this country. There is very little tradition uh, uh, for that and there are very low respect for very fundamental values which are necessary to, uh, 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 for our civil society to operate. The respect for autonomy, respect for self-governance, respect for the freedom of, one, of one's own freedom and the respect of others' freedom. And, uh, and the level of uh, uh, active involvement uh, in the life of the smaller and wider uh, uh, community. Uh, so what we see now, uh, or what we have seen yesterday, or what we have seen in the last four years in Hungary, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult thing because I think that what the government has done in the last four years uh, is not the cause that we need to tackle it's not the problem that we need to solve. It's just a symptom of the underlying problem of a society being there or not being there. Uh, in 2011, in one of the first uh, uh, mass uh, protests, I gave a speech uh, where I said uh, that I'm really happy for this very repressive and aggressive uh, way uh, the government decided to uh, re-regulate uh, media. Uh, because I, th I, I, and I argued uh, that this gives us, Hungarians, or us as a political community, the chance to assess the real value of media and media freedoms. And whatever is happening to the uh, Constitution, the Constitutional Court, the Independent Courts, and every other uh, uh, democratic institution uh, gives us a chance to think about how much we value these institutions. Well, the last four years uh, 
have a very bad uh, 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 send a very bad message uh, because it seems like uh, nothing has been taken that had any real value, at least for those people from whom these institutions were taken. Uh, and uh, so the question is not how do we roll back uh, the destruction of democratic institutions, but how do we build a civil society that is able to defend uh, uh, those democratic institutions when they come into danger? And that's a much, more trick, a much, a much trickier question, because in the last quarter of a century, we had all, all the all, and all the, all the conditions, uh, favorable conditions that were there for a civil society to grow and to flourish. We had a very favorable local regulatory framework. We had a mild local and global political environment. We had a, a global um, economic uh, 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 environment that was uh, also uh, quite happy. Uh, we had all the support uh, through NGOs, through the Open Society Foundation, all the money uh, to build uh, a civil society, but that civil society that we were able to build never grew beyond this 100,000 people. And when I talk to my friends who are active in the NGO field, or when I look at the number of how many people decided to keep their private pension funds, we see that the same number keeps popping up. 100,000 people decided to keep their private pension funds. 100,000 people uh, showed up when it come to, came to protect the uh, Constitution. And then more or less, it's the, uh, these 100,000 people are the same 100,000 people. I started to know everyone by, by name or by face uh, on our mass protest.